Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are once again looking at the suggestions past the developers of January 2020 and after yesterday having a look at the ground stuff, today it's time to have a look at the aviation. There's a lot of propeller aircraft here and also a pretty interesting jet, so overall a decent amount of stuff. The first one is from Milo Cat and it's talking about the JU-52, but it's talking about a specific variant of the JU-52, which is the 52-3M G7E. Now, if you don't know what the Junkers JU-52 is, it's probably the most famous transport aircraft of World War II. It's the tri-engine machine that, of course, the Germans used during the war, and it wasn't just a transport aircraft, though. There were variants which did different things. So in the lead up to World War II, there was a number of Ju-52 3M aircraft which were rebuilt as interim bombers as part of Germany's secret rearmament program. And as the Ju-52 was already a well-known civil airframe, it made sense to basically take them and modify them so they would be useful as bombers. So what they did is they took out the uh, internal cargo bay or the passenger aircraft on these areas basically the center of them and they converted it into two bomb bays capable of holding 1500 kilograms of bombs the defensive armament depending on which ones you look at consisted of multiple 7.92 millimeter machine guns in many different styles but they were generally mounted on the dorsal line of the plane in or just above the cockpit and also in waist hatches or in a ventral gondola or turret. These Ju-52s served as the main bombers of the Luftwaffe until the adoption of more modern designs, uh, which we already have in-game, such as the DO-17, the Ju-88, and the HE-111, and it saw extensive service actually during the Spanish Civil War. It was most infamously, as, uh, most infamously known as the aircraft involved in the bombing of Guernica. And the Ju-52s continued to serve as frontline bombers through the invasion of Poland, so this thing was used in the Second World War, after which they were mostly retired and then reconverted to use as transport aircraft again. So the Ju-52 3MG7E, um, at least from Milo's perspective, would be the starter bomber for the German heavy bomber line since it is such an iconic aircraft and also would be pretty useful with that crazy bomb load. 1500 kilos uh, for a starter bomber is nothing new. Uh, when you have a look at the Farman or the NC-2223, these uh, both have ridiculous bomb loads and also a lot of the early German bombers have pretty good bomb loads as well. The machine was powered by three BMW 132T nine-cylinder radial engines, which all had 715 horsepower each. It was quite a heavy bird, meaning that it could only go a maximum speed of 265 kilometers an hour, and also had six to seven crew members, basically a pilot, a co-pilot, a radio operator, and then all of the gunners. This specific version of the G7E had three single 792mm MG15s as armament uh, in the cockpit and waist hatches, and then you could either have one 792mm or one 13mm MG131 in the dorsal mount, and then one 7.92mm in the ventral gondola on some of the aircraft depending on what you wanted to go for. An overall pretty nice machine and the Ju-52 is an iconic aircraft not because of its bomber variant but because of its transport variant and it would be nice to see it represented in the game. The next one is from Tarek G2014, and this is looking at an Aerocobra, but a very specific Aerocobra, the Browns Aerocobra 1 AH574. This is a British Aerocobra, and it definitely has a very interesting story, and it can actually be classed as one of the only naval Aerocobras that obviously exist. One of the things that I would like to say about this post, it has an absolute metric ton of spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes and it made it really really hard to read and really really hard to get through so just as a general point if you are making these posts make sure to double check your spelling because my god uh, it makes it a lot easier 
at least uh, to be able to get through. If I'm struggling with it, I'm sure other people are struggling with it too. So let's start off with the story of the Aracobra 1, which is obviously the P-39, the American plane, which was mainly used by the Soviet Union, actually, <laughs> not actually America. So in 1940, the British War Office were looking to the US to purchase some new aircraft, and they took an interest in the Bell Model 14. The Bell Model 14 was later known as the P-400, which we already have in the game. So they tested it out, and they were like, you know what, we like this thing, but generally we would like to have some modifications. So they wanted to remove the 37mm and replace it with a 20mm Hispano, also have two 50s in the nose, and then also four 7.62s, which would be in the wings, uh, so two basically per wing. They also had the rudder and elevator shortened, and also a bunch of other adjustments, such as removing the IFF equipment from behind the pilot. This made the vehicle itself 200 pounds lighter lighter than the other versions that existed, and when the first three pre-production aircraft reached RA uh, e. Boscom down, they were recorded as reaching 391 miles per hour, which is pretty quick uh, for the time, outpacing a lot of vehicles, including stuff such as the Hurricane. Now, where did it all go wrong for these vehicles? We start off with uh, the AH-74, or the AH-574, I apologize, and this was the first production aircraft that actually arrived in the UK in 1941, so this was after after testing the pre-production aircraft, they are like, you know, well, let's get some. The problem with it, though, is with the Aracobra 1 and 1A in 1941, the production aircraft were actually noted to be worse than the three pre-production aircraft that the RAF had received, uh, reaching an average speed of only 355 miles per hour, which was actually worse than stuff like the Hurricane. So therefore, the rest of the aircraft uh, were to be sent to the Soviet Union pretty much as simple as that. And the AH-574, uh, though, was saved by the British because of a weird uh, weirdness, I suppose. The weirdness was the Royal Navy were actually interested in the vehicle itself. They wanted to evaluate the use of tricycle undercarriages for landing on aircraft carriers opposed to tail draggers. So this meant that it was moved to Fernborough, and then it became uh, an aircraft of a chief naval test pilot, you might know who he is, Captain Eric Winkle Brown, and Brown is incredibly famous, at least when it comes to British history, for the role he played as a test pilot uh, in the Second World War. He also holds the record for carrier landings, carrier takeoffs, and numerous world firsts, including the first twin-engine carrier landing, the first jet aircraft carrier landing, Landing, and also the first tricycle geared aircraft on a carrier. So basically, uh, Brown used this vehicle uh, all through the war and also um, uh, for before, uh, like in 1945. He requested to go ahead and try and, you know, carry land with it, but it was denied. So he wrote to the captain of the HMS uh, Pretoria Castle, and uh, basically uh, he, he asked if he could give it a go, and uh, it was approved. And then on April 4th, 1945, he feigned engine trouble over Pretoria uh, Castle, and or castle i'm guessing and landed successfully on the carrier itself so it was a vehicle which was used <laughs> a lot through the war basically by eric brown and then near the end of it he was like you know what i want to see if i can actually do this so then he ended up actually landing on the deck of the carrier and uh, you know being able to show that it could be landed on the deck of a carrier the ah 574 wasn't scrapped until 1946 when a Bell test pilot visited Fernborough and took the aircraft for a circuit and recommended it to be scrapped because of basically the state of decay that it had been in. But this aircraft still, you know, had an interesting history and would definitely be pretty cool to see. It had the Allison V 1710E4 engine with 1150 horsepower, had a pretty crazy climb rate as well, and also because of the fact that it was the first 
you know tricycle uh, gear uh, vehicle to be able to land on a carrier at least uh, in British hands I think it definitely should be stuck in game as a pretty nice little premium. The next one we're having a look at is a experimental aircraft from Japan and before we get started I just wanted to say something I thought was kind of funny. So the person who made this post is Satoru Anabuki and also has the location noted as Norway. And I just thought that was a really funny, like, clash of things. <laughs> but anyway, let's get into uh, the Nakajima Ki-106. What is the Ki-106? Well, basically, it is a version of the Ki-84 Army Type 4 fighter. And the difference is it was actually constructed with a wooden fuselage in an attempt to save light alloys. So there was a lot of these plans in late war for Japan to try and be able to manufacture machines which didn't use as many precious materials so therefore they could produce a hell of a lot more of them and this is one of those trials. There were three airframes that were completed by the OG Koku KK uh, which is the Prince Aircraft Company Limited during 1945 and these aircraft were powered by a Nakajima HA45 engine which gave it 1,990 horsepower. It also had larger vertical control surfaces than the standard Ki-83 Thor, and because of the fact it had a wooden fuselage, it needed a thick coat of lacquer uh, on it, which meant it looked very, very smooth. At the same time, it had successful tests in July 1945, but the war ended before the Ki-106 could enter production. And the Ki-106 would be slightly heavier, though, uh, and slightly slower than the Ki-84, but overall would have similar um, would have similar performance. It would be able to go a maximum speed of around about 620 kilometers an hour, and it would also be uh, armed with two 20 millimeter H uh, Ho 5 cannons, and also have provisions for two. 250 kilo bombs. So this could be a nice little premium. Uh, it could also be a nice little event vehicle. I doubt it would be similar to a tech tree vehicle since there already is a lot of Ki 84s in the game, but this could definitely see its way into the game in some pretty nice ways. The next one is from MC205V, and we're talking about a very cool little biplane. This is the single-seater fighter, the RO-41, and it was made for IMAM, or I-M-A-M. -M. It was tested on the 16th of June, 1934, by the pilot Nicolo Lana, but at the time of uh, entry into service in 1936, the ministry actually preferred another vehicle that we already have, the Fiat CR32, and therefore they reserved the role of this uh, vehicle to a, uh, for a second period trainer for students who came from the BA25. So this was basically a second stage in the way that you would train on something first and then you would go to this and then you would push on to actually, you know, flying the, the actual stuff. It was also distributed to the squadrons as a complementary aircraft, um, and also the production of the single-seater was uh, was produced from 1937, and it was also joined by a two-seater plane, which obviously makes sense since it was designed, or at least eventually it was used as a trainer. Uh, these were mixed construction aircraft with the fuselage structure being welded steel tubes covered with canvas and also light alloy panels. The upper wing in the shape of a gull wing was made of light alloy wood and also canvas, or sorry, it was made of light alloy wood and also canvas, and the passenger compartment was open in both versions of the machine. Uh, the fixed trolley and independent fairing wheels also existed on this machine, so very similar to what you see on other biplanes from the Italians, and also it it was really liked by the instructors and also students who flew it. And in 1941, the 50th flock stationed in Tobruk, given the small size of the flight uh, of the planes that they had, they occasionally used some RO-41s in protection cruises on population centers and airports. They even engaged them in combat, uh, which is kind of a surprise. And in addition to Imam, it was also built in the two-seater version 
by Avis and also Augusta until 1943. There was, by well, by 1943, they built 443 of these, and they were still in service at the uh, Regia Aeronautica, and in 1949... Uh, in 1949, uh, Augusta, which owned the license for the vehicle, produced a further series of 25 aircraft, bringing the total of RO-41 planes built to 743 units, with 510 of them being single-seater and 233 being two-seater vehicles. Some of them were used by the RSI, uh, the later uh, were, bar were abandoned basically in 1952, and it is definitely one of those vehicles which would be interesting to see. Uh, the vehicle itself is powered by the Piaggio P7 C45. This gave it 390 horsepower, meaning it had a maximum speed of 322 kilometers per hour, and it also had armament-wise two Breda Safat 7.7 millimeters. So nothing really to write home about, but once again, another cool little biplane in the history of Italy that hopefully will be represented in the game at some point. It's now time to have a look at some French aircraft from Cade, and this is the Law Newport LN40 family, which is pretty much French Stukas, if you want to uh, try and break it down pretty much as simply as that. The story starts, obviously, before World War II, um, but uh, the main thing to understand is during World War II, the value of a specialized dive bomber, except for the situations when it didn't encounter to any enemy resistance in the air was, uh, let's just say, not great. Um, basically, the Ju-87 fell out of fashion very quickly, and pretty much every other nation uh, kind of stopped their developments when it came to these stuff. But before the war, in the late 20s, the 1920s, the idea was incredibly popular, and that's why a bunch of different ones uh, started popping up from everywhere. After the appearance of the aircraft, the Junker K-4, 47, it spread more and more widely. That is, of course, the popularity of the idea. And by the mid 1930s, all major aviation powers were developing their own dive bombers. In France, the Societe Anonymous, uh, Anonymous Loire Newport Company, which in 1936 was nationalized and renamed the Societe Nationale de Constructio uh, Aeronautique de l'Est. Uh, began to be interested in the potential capabilities of the dive bomber in, uh, since 1932. And under the direction of M. Pillion, uh, the designers of the Newport plant at Issey le Molyneux uh, in 1934 created the design of the NI-140 aircraft. It was uh, a dive bomber which had both crew members sat next to each other, and it was intended for use on aircraft carriers as well. There were two prototypes, or the first two prototypes, the NI-140N901, took off in March 1935, and according to the concept, uh, it was close to the German dive bomber, the Junker Ju-87, which was around at the time, and the construction of the prototype, uh, uh, however, only began when the French uh, plane began flight tests, and the external resemblance was so great that during the years of the German occupation, during World War II, Pillion was actually accused um, that his plane was constructed on the basis of information stolen from the design bureau of Junkers by French spies. And after gaining some experience after testing the two um, vehicles, uh, the NI-140s, in 1936, the Pillion group uh, began designing a single-seater deck dive bomber with a semi-retractable landing gear and unfortunately, there was no technical specification for this or the class at the time. But yeah, I always find it funny that during the Second World War, he was just accused of stealing. He was accused of stealing plans uh, on something that wasn't built yet, and he'd already built his first prototype. It's 
Just kind of a crazy, uh, crazy story. Uh, the aircraft, which was named the LN-40, kept the in the inverted Seagull wing like its predecessor, the two prototypes, and it had two advantages. It allowed to shorten the landing gear racks and place the wing folding nodes low enough so that the technicians did not need to uh, a step or step ladder when folding the planes. The fuselage uh, was based on the design of the experimental single-seat fighter, the Ni-161, one, and all fuel was concentrated in the center wing. The lower part of the steering wheel was divided along the vertical axis into two parts, turning in opposite directions perpendicular to the fuselage, and special suspension under the fuselage allowed to throw a bomb from under the blade sweeping disc. The main landing gear legs folded back and uh, into a retracted position. The wheels were half out, and so they did actually move. You know, they weren't uh, static like a lot of the JU-87s. The prototype LM-40 No. 1 preceded its flight test in Villa Kubel uh, in June 1938, and the plane was piloted by Pierre Nado, who was the main test pilot for SNCAO at the time. The flights showed the need to increase the area of the vertical tail, and to do this, at the end of the stabilizer, they put pitching washers, and in this form, in September 1938, the aircraft was presented for official tests held at CEMA in Villa Couble, and further flights were made in November at the Marine Aviation Test Center at St. Raphael. And uh, even before that, the SNCAO tester, Aber, had performed a series of 10 hook landings and 15 dives from various heights, basically showing that it could land on carriers. And during the latter, the braking device in the steering wheel turned badly. This meant that this innovation was abandoned and went over to the modification of the chassis, which was used as an aerodynamic brake. And in 1937, the Ministry of Aviation ordered six LN-40s for the fleet, but they didn't differ much from the prototype, although a number of changes were made to the design. In particular, forged knots were used instead of rivets, the 12-cylinder liquid-cooled engine, which developed 670 horsepower at takeoff, was stored on serial vehicles, and uh, 690 horsepower uh, at an altitude of 4,000 meters. The outer parts of the two spar iron or wing, um, or wing, sorry, or metal wing, turned uh, with respect to the rear spar and folded back. A landing hook was placed to the semi retractable tail wheel, and on July the 3rd, a new order for 36 aircraft was made, which would be designated the LN401. And then the Air Force, because obviously we were talking about the carrier fleets of the naval side, the Air Force actually called uh, it the LN411. Uh, it was very similar to the deck variant, but the wing didn't fold. Uh, so, because obviously, you know, you don't need to save space. Uh, on the ground. There were also inflatable floats looks as a landing hook and also uh, the wings tail emeralds and hoods were manufactured by the SNCAO plant in Saint-Nazaire and fuselages were made in issy le molyneux then, uh, by October 1939, the commander of the French Air Force was completely disappointed with the capabilities of the LN-411. And, well, that was kind of the fate of a lot of dive bombers, and on the 3rd of October, decided to hand over all aircraft except one to the fleet. The Air Force headquarters considered that the vehicle was too slow and not maneuverable enough to participate in modern warfare, and this possessed a much smaller combat load than the JU-87B and only slightly surpassing the uh, German speed, uh, German uh, dive speed. The LN-411 could easily become an easy prey for fighters and also anti-aircraft gunners, which obviously meant that it wouldn't be too useful. And then uh, they did actually make a, uh, they did make a few others. So you had the 40, the 401, the 411, and also the 42. The 42 
was a new aircraft based on the LN-40, the dive bomber developed by the French company Loire uh, Newport, and the aircraft was a further development of the family from the 411, the only aircraft the LN-42 uh, had. It had a new wing, new tail, and smaller swing, and the Hispano Sousa 12Y51 engine with a capacity of 1100 horsepower. It didn't have time uh, to make test flights, it was hidden from the occupying forces of Germany. And the plane took off only on the 24th of August 1945 at Tusu Lenob, and in 1947 it was dismantled. Basically, if you have a look at these vehicles, they are just generic uh, dive bombers, which you know is fine. Uh, you know the the guns that they have was kind of interesting, though. You know they had one 20 millimeter, the Hispano Sousa HS404, and also two 7.5 millimeter machine guns, and the bombs. It could carry was one 225 kilo bomb or one 165 or 10 10 kilos or 15 kilo bombs uh, so the uh, the actual bomb loads aren't great but the actual weaponry ain't too bad you know 120 and 275s at low br i could definitely see that working especially for a dive bomber and its maximum speed was 380 kilometers an hour with a cruise speed of around about 300 which wouldn't have been too bad either Basically, as I said, this is a French Stuka. It's kind of an interesting idea. Would be nice to see it in the game. The last one is from RC1140, and this is the Avro Canada CF105, or as you may know, it's the Avro Arrow. This machine is, of course, Canadian-born. It never entered service, but it has a very interesting history and seems to be close to a lot of Canadians' hearts. The program itself started in 1953, when the Royal Canadian Air Force put out a requirement for an all-weather interceptor. It needed to be capable of flying at Mach 1.5 at 50,000 feet. Its main role was going to be uh, keeping the Arctic regions of Canada secure in case that the USSR would send nuclear bombers across the Arctic. And uh, basically, Avro Canada was chosen to build the aircraft to the requirements. The aircraft was introduced to the public on the 4th of October 1957, with its first flight of the CF-105 being on the 25th of March 1958. The aircraft didn't see production, it didn't see combat, and it was never mass-produced, and the whole project was shut down in February 1959 due to many different facets, one of them being political reasons. There are technically two variants or two models of the Avro Arrow. Both were fully built and a total of six aircraft were produced. The Mark I variant uh, had the Pratt and Whitney J-75 turbojet engines, while the Mark II variants had Canadian-built Arendo Iroquois PS-13 turbojet engines, which is pretty cool. The uh, Even though the Avro Arrow Mark II was fully completed, it only did taxi trials and it never actually flew. But the combined flight time of the five first aircraft, which were the Mark I variants, was 70 hours and 30 minutes. Now, what is interesting about this vehicle is it doesn't have any guns. Um, since this thing was designed just to be an interceptor to annihilate, um, you know, uh, bombers which were coming over from the USSR, it only was designed to have missile armament. Basically, uh, it had two cancelled sets of armament. One was the AIM-7B Sparrow IIs, the other one was the Velvet Glove missiles, but if this thing ever came to the game, uh, basically, the vehicle would have access to eight AIM-4 Falcon missiles, and that would be it, uh, which were mounted in a central area under, you know, under the... Um, under basically just behind and under the cockpit. So yeah, you would have no guns, you would have no armament apart from AIM-4 Falcons. Now, if you don't know about AIM-4 Falcons, uh, they're not exactly great. Um, they had a massive uh, failure rate. The main issue with the AIM-4 Falcon compared to something like the AIM-9 Sidewinder that we have a lot in the game.
game is the Sidewinder has a proximity fuse on it, meaning that it has to only get close to the machine to be able to do damage. The Falcon had to hit the machine um, because it didn't have a proximity fuse on it, uh, and therefore you really had to be accurate with them, and unfortunately the technology at the time wasn't there enough to be accurate with them, so that is a bit of a problem. The highest recorded level flight speed for this machine was Mach 1.96, and also its maximum recorded speed was Mach 1.98, so they didn't reach the Mach 2 area, but they got very, very close, and also um, it was able to do many different things, uh, but the main thing is the Arrow was one of the first aircraft to have a fly-by-wire system, which had two control modes. You had the normal mode, had a damping system, which stabilized the aircraft on all three axes, and then it had an emergency mode, where its hydraulic controls would be mechanically controls. It also had air brakes, which were on the belly of the plane, uh, behind the weapons bay, and there was also a drag chute on the aircraft as well. Even though this thing, you know, was never put into production, was never fully produced, uh, as I said, a lot of people really enjoy this machine, and at some point it will probably come to the game. The problem is, is the armament options. They really limit this thing, and it will mean it will be incredibly hard to use it compared to some of the vehicles it will come up against because of its performance of its engines. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Teddy, John Ryman, Universe A, Conte Baraka, Trigger Hippie, Eugens Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, Hosest Cachot, Hans, Barine, and Samuel Schlick for supporting the channel.